Are we all good to start? Cool. Anyone need some time? No, all good? Okay. Cool. Do the mics work? Can you guys hear me? Not that I need it. It's a pretty small room, but that's all right. Okay, so some of you I've met, some of you I haven't. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Hamza. Um, obviously in third year, I'm down in trial again at La Trobe Regional Hospital for the year, which is great. You guys should come. We can talk about that later anyway. Um, thanks for coming down. I understand there's a me missing at 6.30, so we should be finished by 6.15. I'll be finished before that, but that's our aim. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to shout out. Like if I don't see your hand, just shout out my name. Um, if I can answer it in 10 seconds, I will. If I think you'll need a little bit longer or a diagram or something, I can talk to you afterwards if you're still interested by then. Uh, but that should be everything. So let us get started. Any questions before we start? Nope. All right, where did I get all of our stuff from? So I was talking to Minaj and he said, you guys and Zane and someone else, um, they said you do have topic tests now, not those, not the MSTs. Um, except the content should still be pretty much the same. So what I've used is lecture notes from my year. Um, so that's my notes and the lecture slides, VESPA notes, our VESPAs, um, past revision lectures, especially the 2017 one, because that would be mo most relevant to you guys, and some of the MEMIS notes. But do bear in mind that faculty might have done what med faculty does and just changed things randomly without telling us. And so if stuff hasn't been covered, Maybe we didn't cover it, but you did. And I might say some stuff that is not relevant to you, so just ignore it. All right, so what are we going to be covering? We will cover anatomy, clinical stuff, physiology, pharmacology, and microbiome. Start off with anatomy. And this is what we're going to be covering here, 10 things. I won't read them out. We'll get to them. So first up is surface anatomy. We'll go from the outside in. So you would have met these regions, and they'll be more relevant in your clinical things. You guys did have a VESPA at 3.30, yeah? About GI clinical skills? A PSP? No? Yesterday, was it about GI clinical? Yeah, okay, cool. That's why I didn't cover that, because I'm like, you already would have had stuff on it. Um, so there's different regions. You've got four regions, which is a quadrant, makes sense, and nine regions. And the one we use more is, it's kind of a mix of both. If stuff is in, any of these four quadrants. So in the corners, we use quadrants. And if it's in the middle, then usually you use these three. Um, Monash will use both of them. Uh, might be handy to know the vertical lines on the nine region is your midclavicular lines, just extend it all the way down. And horizontal is your subcostal and your transtubercular, meaning the iliac tubercles. Okay, that was pretty easy. Abdominal wall, this stuff is super important. Um, make sure you know it, please. Starting off, Externally, it's literally just memorization, but we'll go through it. Skin, fat, campus fascia, a bit of a mnemonic there. I don't know if you guys heard of it. Uh, scarpus fascia. And then you've got your three muscles, one, two, three, um, with their fascias. And transversalis fascia is especially important. We'll talk about that more later. And then you've got extra peritoneal fat, the peritoneum itself, and then the abdominal cavity. So let's talk about the muscles. You've got two groups of muscles, flat ones and the vertical ones. Flat is your external obliques, internal obliques, and your transversus abdominis, which is pretty much the same as your intercostals up in your chest. And so external obliques go inferior medially, hands in pockets. Um, internal obliques go superior medially, hands on chest. And transversus abdominis is transverse, as the name suggests, so it's horizontal. Vertically, you've got the rectus abdominis and pyramidalis. Who cares about that one? Whatever. Um, 
So the rectus sheath, this is really important too. So basically these three muscles here um, have an aponeurosis, which combines, and it covers the rectus abdominis from the front and the back. And so we've got a concept called the arcuate line. And where is it located? Firstly, it's halfway between your umbilicus and your pubic symphysis. Um, so above the line, you've got your rectus sheet being, being both anterior and posterior. So as you can see, it's at the front and it's at the back. Um, but below the line, it changes so that all of it is anterior. There's nothing posterior. And so typical Monash question, below the arcuate line, what is the rectus abdominis? What is it in contact with? And the answer won't be the aponeurosis, it's going to be transversalis fascia. Um, and I just chucked this in at the line, what happens? Um, this is where your inferior epigastric vessels perforate the rectus and then they travel upwards. Any questions so far? No? Nope? Cool. Um, in the middle of your rectus, you've got your linear alba, which separates it, and you've also got horizontal ones. I don't think they're terribly important though. What is it innovated by? Um, who cares where it comes from, T7 to L1, whatever. What's important is just like your chest, it runs between your transversus abdominis and your internal oblique. So that's important to keep in mind. And umbilical folds, these are also on the posterior side of your anterior abdominal wall. And you've got three of them. So the median fold is what your embryonic uricus was. Your medial Fold is your fetal umbilical arteries, and those ones aren't really important because you probably don't have them anymore. Um, lateral ones are the most important. This is where your inferior epigastric vessels run, and we'll talk more about this in the clinical section. Cool. Surface anatomy and abdominal wall was done. Any questions? Good. Abdominal cavity. So what is it made up of? You've got your central gut tube, which is mouth, the bum, and then this gut tube is suspended by mesentery. And I'm sure you would have had that Lazarus lecture that embryology, that made no sense whatsoever, and hopefully makes sense now. So what exactly is mesentery? It's basically a peritoneum folded on itself, and you've got ventral mesentery and dorsal. So ventral is only proximally, and it's basically like this, and the liver just grows into it, and then dorsal mesentery is pretty much everything else, and so this is along the length um, of your GI tract. So you've got peritoneum, then you've got mesentery, and then you've got omentum. So the greater omentum is a double fold of mesentery, which means it's four layers of your peritoneum. And this originates quite aptly from the greater curvature of the stomach. And this basically, this is your colon. It envelops the colon and drapes over your small intestine. So have you guys done dissection for GI yet? Yeah, so you would have seen, you cut it open. The first thing you see is the apron, uh, which is your greater omentum. It's got a few functions apart from, you know, what fat normally does. It's, all, it's called the policeman of the abdomen. And that's because if there's any inflammation, it kind of moves to wall off that inflammation. Now, don't ask me how a piece of fat can move. Well, you can ask me because it's really cool, but probably not relevant, so you can go Google it yourself. So that's greater momentum, and then you've got lesser momentum from the lesser curvature of the stomach. And what's important here is that it has two parts, two ligaments, the hepatogastric and the hepatoduodenal, which we will talk about later. Any questions? Nope. All right. General regions. You guys know this, yeah? Cool. Good. All right, the vasculature of those three. Um, so foregut, celiac trunk, T12, which is starts here. It's got three branches. First one is well, one of them is a splenic, which runs to the hind the stomach, which we will talk about later, which splits off into continues onto the spleen, goes up to the short gastric and left gastroepiploic or gastroemental. Number two is your common hepatic, which drops off your gastroduodenal, which goes down like this. After dropping that off, well, wait, yep. After dropping that off, you've got the right gastric, which goes to the stomach, and then it becomes the proper hepatic, which splits into the left and the right hepatic. From the right hepatic, you got the cystic, which we'll again talk about later. Uh, we say gastroduodenal, that goes down, separates into pancreatic duodenal arteries, the superior one, the inferior one, uh, comes from the SMA, and then your right gastroemental. So, yeah, and then you've got left gastric here, which gives off a tiny esophageal branch as well, which is also important, and we'll talk about that later. So this is pretty much just know how to draw this. Know this splenic and its relation to the stomach and the gastroduodenal and its relation to the duodenum, which we'll talk about. Um, 
and that should be everything. It's interesting to note the stomach is supplied by all three of these branches, nothing else is. Cool, that's at T12. Then we go down to superior mesenteric at L1, and this one again branches. So, wait, yep. First off, you've got jejunal and ileal. Going along further down the small intestine, iliopolic. This is what supplies off this one, is what your um, artery to the appendix comes off. And then you've got right colic, middle colic, and it can kind of continues down there. So that's nice and simple. And then you've got your hindgut, which is supplied by your IMA. And so that one is left colic and sigmoid and your superior rectal. Um, connecting these two here is a marginal artery. And something you learn more in year three, but basically where two zones uh, connect. So, you know, the distribution from one artery is here, distribution from the other artery is here. In the middle, it's got the least competent uh, vascular supply. So if there was a problem that was going to happen, a vascular problem, it would probably happen here. And who can tell me what this point also represents? That one there. To do with full gut, mid gut, hind gut. Mate, there's whispering. I'm assuming you guys are right. Yeah, two thirds along the transverse colon is where you transition from mid gut to hind gut. Hence why we're talking about the arteries. Um, cool. That was arteries. We'll go to veins. And the main thing you need to know is the portal system. And so you guys have heard of the portal poodle. <laughs> yes. Is there something I should know? Why do you guys groan? Um, so, yeah. SMV, IMV, which combines with your splenic here. They call it gastrosplenic, but it's splenic and then the gastric, left gastric also comes in and goes up to the hepatic portal vein, which goes into the liver, and we'll talk about that later. Cool, so that's the vascular chart. Now let's talk about the three regions um, themselves. Start off with foregut. Obviously, it starts with, you'll talk more about, you know, mouth, pharynx, larynx, and head and neck, which is incredibly cool. It's like the best anatomy you'll ever do. Um, if you guys think this is good, just wait. So you've got you've got the esophagus, which starts at C6, so at your cricoid, the inferior border of your cricoid, and it continues until T11 at your lower esophageal sphincter where it enters the stomach. You've got three constriction points. This is important. And so cricopharyngeal, which is your first sphincter of your gastrointestinal system, the one which helps you swallow. The aortic and the left main bronchus, some textbooks separate these, who cares? And then the lower esophageal, like we talked about. Um, vasculature of the esophagus is important. The top two thirds is not important. Inferior thyroid, artery, and vein, whatever. Thoracic aorta and the azygous vein, whatever. The bottom is important because the vein is the left gastric vein, which as you'll recall is part of the portal system. And so that's going to be relevant in portal hypertension, which we'll talk about in the clinical section. Stomach, nothing too exciting here. It's got different parts, cardia, fundus, body, and pylorus. You can check in the antrum if you want. Uh, the muscles from superficial to deep. So on the very outside, you've got the longitudinal layer, then you've got the circular layer, and then the oblique layer. And when you do a gastroscopy, the stuff that you see is the inner lining of the stomach, and you see the rugae, which is basically all of the folds, which helps increase total surface area and helps it mush around. And then you've got the curvatures like we talked about. So lesser curvature and greater curvature. And then you've got the duodenum. This is probably the most important thing in this slide. So you've got four parts, D1 to four. Uh, D1, the important thing to note is the cap is the only bit which is intraperitoneal. The rest of it is retroperitoneal. And we'll talk about those structures later. Um, and like we talked about in the vasculature, behind D1, you've got the gastroduodenal artery. So if you have a peptic ulcer, and it erodes, it's going to erode into this artery. And Monash will probably ask you that question. Number two contains the major duodenal papilla. What's the significance of that? Come on, guys. Monash, hit me. Mm -hmm. That is true, and we'll talk about that later. In terms of the GI tube itself, what does it represent? Hello, help me. Okay, I shouldn't have skipped over that slide. You guys said you knew this stuff. This is where foregut becomes midgut. Yep, sorry for picking on you guys. You're the only two people I really know. Well, I know some other people, but yeah. 
Uh, we'll get around to you guys. So this is where foregut becomes midgut at D2, at the major duodenal papilla specifically, and all of the stuff which you guys said, which we'll talk about later. This will happen to you a lot. Consultants will ask you questions and you say 10 right answers, but they're not looking for that. They're looking for that one tiny piece of information and they'll say, nah, mate, sorry. So get used to it from now. D3 is not terribly important. Um, it is anterior to the aorta and the IBC, and it's posterior to the SMA and SMV. That is kind of important, which we'll talk about in clinical. Um, and the last one, D4, this is where the duodenum ends at the duodenal jejunal flexure at L2. Um, and this flexure is supported by the ligament of trites, and that mainly originates from the right crease of the diaphragm. Cool? Any questions so far? Um, I do have questions, but I thought we'd get through the content first. And, you know, after anatomy, we'll do anatomy questions. After this, we'll do this questions. But if you have any questions, chuck them. Cool. Liver. Uh, you've got different lobes. And so the anatomical lobes are divided by the falciform ligament, which is what you see on the anterior surface. That's this thing, but on the anterior side. And then the functional lobes, which is more important, is Cantley's line. And that's this imaginary line right here. The hepatic H is also important. Um, is your topic test online or on paper? It's online, yeah? Yeah, OK. So you won't be asked to draw it, but you will be asked to, I don't know, maybe to pick, pick the right one. And the H is basically IVC and the gallbladder here. So the two proper organy things are on are one limb of the H. The other one is your ligamentum venosum, which used to be your ductus venosus. And you know you've got a ductus arteriosus in your heart which bypass the lungs, so your ductus venosus bypass your liver. Because as a baby, your mum does all the liver stuff for you, you don't need it. Um, and then the ligamentum teres, which is your umbilical vein. And in the middle, you've got the porta hepatis, which is where the portal triad enters. And the portal triad is these three things. Hepatic portal vein, the proper hepatic artery, and the common hepatic duct. And basically these three things enter, enter the liver, and then they go out horizontally between the lobes and go out to the little lob lobules and the hexagonal hepatocytes. Okay, is it intraperitoneal? Yes, apart from a tiny bit on the anterior surface, so the other side of this, which is in contact with the diaphragm. So if you have liver pathology, it could irritate the diaphragm, which will give you referred pain to your shoulder. Um, and your hepatic veins, right, middle, left, and they all, they run vertically. So while the portal triad ran, ran horizontally between the liver lobes, the hepatic veins run vertically, and they join uh, to form the IVC. One of our anatomy tutors asked a question, what holds the liver in place? Um, does anyone know? What stops it from moving around the abdomen? So some of us said falciform ligament, I don't know, peritoneum or whatever, but it's basically the IVC. It's literally like there's a liver, and you impaled it with the IVC, so it's not going anywhere. That wasn't important, it was just cool. <laughs> All right, gallbladder. So it's got different parts. It's got the fundus, it's got the body, um, the infundibulum, and the neck. And the infundibulum has a part called Hartman's pouch, and this is where gallstones are most commonly stuck. So you should know that. And finally, you've got the pancreas. So it's got different parts as well, the head, which includes the uncinate process, the neck, the body, and the tail. So this is secondarily retroperitoneal. We'll get to that in embryology. Um, the only bit is the tail is basically touching the spleen, and the spleen is intraperitoneal. Therefore, the tail is also intraperitoneal. Any questions? No? Cool. So the hepatobiliary tree, this is also important. That's a, a lot of different types of questions they can ask you, like clinical questions, but you need to know this basic anatomy. And so you start off with the left and right hepatic ducts, these two things up here. They combine to form the common hepatic duct. And the common hepatic combines with the cystic to form the common bile duct. The common bile duct goes down, and as our friend uh, was telling us, common bile duct plus the pancreatic um, becomes the hepatopancreatic, which ends at the ampulla of vata. And this opens up into the major, major duodenal papilla. And that papilla is controlled by a sphincter, the sphincter of Oddi. Simple enough? Cool. And then you've got Callous Triangle, so you should know the borders of this. Um, they asked us this in surgery as well, so you will need to remember it past your topic test. 
laterally, you've got the cystic duct, you've got the inferior border of the liver, and the common hepatic. And through here runs the cystic artery. So in a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which is really cool, um, I got to assist in one and like hold the camera and do all the camera stuff, which is awesome. Um, although you do have to wear like huge lead aprons because they do an intraoperative calangiogram to see where the bile duct is and whether you've cut it right. Those things weigh like 50 kilos, which is terrible. And when you're doing like five of them in a day, your back hurts. So this is probably the most important part because you want to chop off the cystic artery before cutting the bile duct, before doing anything else. Otherwise, it's going to bleed everywhere. And then you've got the spleen. Who knows what it does? I'm in third year. I still don't know. It's located deep to ribs 9 to 11. Um, clinically, I don't know you guys did clinical stuff, whatever. Um, and it's connected to the stomach via the gastrosplenic ligament. And if you remember um, the celiac trunk branches, you had the short gastric arteries. And those arteries run in this ligament. Um, so this was one of the questions on our exam. Might come up, who knows? Am I allowed to say that? Yeah. They release questions now, so it's fine. Yeah, cool. All right, that was four guys. Any questions? No, nope? cool. You guys have covered all of this stuff. Yep. There's nothing that I've said that you haven't covered. Cool. All right, mid gut. So you've got jejunum and ileum, and it's best to compare these two because they're very similar. And so jejunum is they're both intraperitoneal. Jejunum is more up here. Ilium is lower in the lower quadrants. So the histology, you've got arcades, which are these little archy things. Um, and so jejunum has simple arcades, and therefore it has longer vasa recta. And I don't know if you've heard of it, jejunal giraffe is a cool way to remember it. Um, whereas the ilium has more convoluted arcades, so you can see there's a lot more. And therefore the vasa recta are shorter. Jejunum has thicker, more folded plica circularis, whereas the ilium has less folded. And who can tell me why that is? Yeah, cool, because that's the first part of your small intestine which is going to come in contact with food. So it's going to want to absorb more of it. Um, and then there's less mesenteric fat here, and there's more in the ilium. So, yep, what's the function of it, apart from absorbing all the other things. Um, your duodenum absorbs iron, jejunum absorbs folate, and ileum absorbs B12. You probably have a mnemonic for this, so I don't need to tell you guys. Do you? I shouldn't say it on recording. So, yeah, cool. And one last thing is pious patches are very specific to the ileum. So, you guys have seen pictures of them. It's basically in histology, which I know everyone hates, is just going to be a big purple blob. And those are immunological things. Who cares what they do? But it, it basically, if you see a picture and a big purple blob, um, that's a pious patch, and that's in the ileum. Questions? No. Nope. All right, then you've got the large intestine. So where does it go? Cecum, which is intraperitoneal, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, which is secondarily retroperitoneal. And then the sigmoid, which is intra. I don't need this. Go away. There we go. Um, you've got the tinea coli, which is bands of smooth muscle which run, run along the colon. And these basically tighten up just a little bit. And so they create the bulges in the small, uh, large intestine called the house drug. There's three bands of the tinea coli. You've got the mesocolic, you've got the amental, and you've got the free. And these, all of these three converge and then you at the appendix. And so when you do an appendicectomy and you're trying to find where it is, you basically follow them. And there's a Mercedes sign because it looks like a Mercedes when they all join. And that's when you, that's when you know you've got the appendix. And then you have the epiploic appendages or the mental appendages. They're just specific to the large intestine. If you see them, you know where you are. But they're blobs of fat and who cares what they do. All right, so that was Midgar. Cool. Now we're off to Hindgar. So the large intestine is the same. So the, obviously the sigmoid colon is part of large intestine. Um, and then the rectum, there's nothing terribly exciting there in the anatomy section anyway. Then you've got the anal canal. This is important. Monash loves this. And so this is actually extra peritoneal. Um, it's not intra or retro or secondarily retro. It's outside of the peritoneum. 
And it's separated by the pectinate line, also called the dentate line, which is this thing here. And this is super important because this is basically endoderm and this is ectoderm, which means all of the things supplying it are different. So up here, we've got the SMA and the SMV supplying it. So this is your portal system. Um, and who can remember which artery it was? Yeah, superior rectal, I think I heard that, nice. Um, and then over here, you've got the inferior rectal arteries, um, which comes from your systemic system. And so that's gonna be important later in the clinical thing. Um, this one is visceral nerves, this one is somatic nerves, so dull pain, sharp pain, um, and the lymph nodes are different as well. And I think we had a question about this. It was like, if you have a cancer which is distal to the pectinate line, where is it going to go next? And so you had to know, is it this lymph node or is it this lymph node? I'm not sure if that's important for you guys, but just keep that in mind. Cool, any questions with that? No, am I going too fast? Is this making sense? Awesome. All right, so that's hindgut. We'll get to embryology. Um, good old Lazarus. So forga, basically what determines what is intra or retroperitoneal, it's the stomach. And did she make you guys, like three of you come up and one of you was the stomach and yeah, yeah, cool. It's actually really helpful. I still remember, I think it was Nathan was the stomach in our grade. So it helps. Um, basically anything that's in front of the stomach, including the stomach, is intraperitoneal. Anything behind it is retroperitoneal. Um, this is all the intra things, I won't go through them. And this is a handy mnemonic to remember what is retroperitoneal. But it's pretty self-explanatory, it makes sense. I'll give you a moment, Manoj is intensely looking at that. So, you done? Cool. You guys have these slides, so you can go look at that um, if you need more time. All right, so the liver. So we said before that there's ventral mesentery, which is only proximally in the gut tube, and the liver basically punches into it, and it grows forward, uh, but there's not enough space in the tiny baby's stomach, and so it pulls everything to the right. And so the liver is basically responsible for the end organization of your abdominal cavity. And then you've got the pancreas. And so the pancreas initially started off like this, and then the ventral bud was like, yo, wait for me, and slapped over to the dorsal bud. And then this becomes secondarily retroperitoneal, apart from one part, which is the tail. Cool. All right. You guys have done this? Yep. So mid-gut, hindgut embryology. So this is the caudal limb. I don't know why it's colored, but this is your large intestine. No, wait. This one's large intestine. This one's cranial limb, which is small intestine. So firstly, it herniates outside of your umbilicus. And then your large intestine rotates 90 degrees anti-clockwise, like here. So this circle is meant to represent the umbilicus, so it's outside of your abdomen, basically, which is pretty cool. And it does a weird flippy thing. So now your large intestine is here, and your small intestine is here. And all this time, as you can see, the small intestine is growing and becoming longer. So firstly, the small intestine comes back in, and then the large intestine comes back in. And finally, um, the ascending colon grows down from here. And so this is why you get that appearance. Uh, when you first open up your abdomen, you're gonna get large intestine in front and then small intestine behind it. And this is why. Um, obviously, if you have problems with this, you can get it swapped the other way. If you can get strangulations. I don't think we covered it in much detail, so I haven't included it. All right. Lastly, we've got some random things. So we'll start off with the inguinal canal. Uh, you'll do this again in repro, which is lots of fun. Not um, So the borders of the inguinal canal. Have you heard of this mnemonic before? Well, this is basically to help you remember what constitutes these uh, different borders or boundaries. So you've got this roof on the top, then you've got anterior, you've got the floor, and you've got posterior. So it's in the malt order. The top is muscle, the front is an aponeurosis, the floor is a ligament, and then posteriorly, you've got T for transversalis fascia or tendon. Um, so yeah, the muscles, at the top, you've got your internal obliques and your transversus abdominis. At the front, you've got the aponeurosis of the external and internal oblique. On the floor, you've got the ligaments, so your inguinal and lacuna ligament. And then posteriorly, you've got the fascia and the conjoined tendon. So as you can see through this picture, 
spermatic cord enters through the deep inguinal ring. It goes through this canal, which is actually pretty short, um, and then it comes out the superficial inguinal ring. Make sense? Cool. What does it contain? So in men, it's the spermatic cord, and in women, it's the round ligament, which you'll do in repro, but it basically holds the uterus up and stops it from falling down. And there's femoral canal as well, which is good to know, and the contents of it, navel. You would have done this in lower limb. Yeah. Okay, scrotum. So you should know the layers of um, the scrotum and how they correspond to the layers of your abdominal wall. So this is a handy mnemonic. Um, yep. So you start off with skin, so this gray one here. So the skin um, of your scrotum is the same as the skin on your abdominal wall. You've got Dato's fascia, which is this yellow thing, and that corresponds to Scarpa's fascia in your abdominal wall. Your external spermatic fascia, this orangey stuff, is your external oblique. So these three things are muscles. It's your external oblique. Um, then your cremaster muscle, which is responsible for retracting the testicles when they get cold. Um, this is your internal oblique, yep, this thing. Um, as you can see, this is your transversus abdominis, and it doesn't actually go down. So that's important to know. It doesn't supply anything in the scrotum. And then you've got your internal spermatic fascia, this blue thing, which is your transversalis fascia. And then you've got your tunica vaginalis, which is basically your peritoneum. And so this is a tunica vaginalis. If it's still patent, when it's not meant to be. It's meant to close off. It's called a processus vaginalis which is where your gubernaculum did the thing and pulled everything down. You guys familiar with that? Yeah, cool. Any questions? This is a basic memorization, just draw it 10 times. All right, um, transpyloric plane. Where is it? It's at the level of L1, and this is halfway between your jugular notch and your pubic symphysis, okay? What comes here? Obviously the pylorus, because it's the transpyloric plane. You've got SMA, like we mentioned before, other things, the hyla of the kidney, I think it's a left kidney, maybe it's the right kidney because one of them's higher, one of them's lower. You can check that out. The sphincter of Oddi and some other things. The end of the spinal cord, this isn't relevant in GI, but it will be later. So these are the main things. And Monash apparently loved uh, the transpilar plane. So please be familiar with this. Okay, we got two questions. Oh, so I have chocolate for you guys. Where did it go? If you get it right. Um, who wants to answer the first question? I'm not showing you. Come on. All right, whatever. We'll just get you guys to shout it out. Nice, who was that? All right, let us check out my throwing skills and your catching skills. Whoops. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, just be ready for that, sorry. Cool, see, trends of Salas Fascia. What did we say, sorry? B. That's not what I had. Yeah. And so the greater sac is, while it's related to the greater momentum, it's actually different. This is what we were taught. And yeah, this was an interesting, I don't think we were actually taught this, but one of the older years told me this, but it's a continuation of the less momentum. Okay? If you don't believe me, just go and Google it. I might be wrong. Um, but just make sure. Um, anyone want to argue? No? Cool. <laughs> Wait, who said E? All right. Do you want chocolate? You can get my chocolate. <laughs> Mate, all right. Okay, fine. I'll give it to you then. Oh, that was close. Sorry. 
Well, so someone said E or D or Yeah, cool. And so basically this is the first point at which the common bile duct, so the, the liver and the gallstone stuff meet the pancreatic stuff. <coughs> Who said that? Was it you? Nice. One out of three. We're going good. And so these these are pretty like simple-ish questions. And so this is like it's usually the bulk of what I don't know what the topic tests are like, but most of the questions when asked asked are like this. And then they've got a few which just screw you over. And so I'm sorry, I can't do anything for you about that. Do we have do we have a consensus? Yep, A. And so <laughs> Yeah. I usually capitalize that, but I'm like, come on, you guys can read. That's probably the <laughs> or, or so I thought. Um that's probably the most important thing with because they will screw you over with like wording and changing one tiny is this false or which of these is not false. It's like, come on, man. Um, but yeah, it's A. Which part of the duodenum does it? D4. Cool. And yeah, this is uh, where the major papilla was, and that's where it all comes in. Oh, yeah. Who was that? Okay, okay. These things do not fly. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which of these is not a correct distinction? Which of these is false? <laughs> what? Someone said D? You said D? Yeah. <laughs> why why did you say D? It's wrong. <laughs> B, I heard B. Nice. So yeah, Jejunum had fewer arcades and longer vasorectal. Remember, Minaj said you want to absorb more stuff in the jejunum, so it's got more plaque circularis. Um, it doesn't have pious patches, whatever. And yeah, because it's got more plaque circularis, because you want to absorb more stuff, it actually does have a thicker wall and it's got less um, mesentery, less fat. Who said that? Somewhere over there. Somewhere over there. You did? You sure? Yep, yeah, cool. Not you, sorry. You don't have to duck away. You can catch it and give it to the dude. <laughs> then it just hit you. Okay. All right. Any questions about those questions? No. Nope. Any questions about questions in general? No. Nope. All right. And so clinical, this is the good stuff and the fun stuff and important for your topic test and via and next year as well. So we're going to be talking about just a bunch of different conditions, foregut, midgut, hindgut, vascular stuff and other conditions. All right, esophageal varices. So we mentioned that the bottom of the esophagus is where you have the left gastric vein um, draining it. And so that's part of the portal system. So if you have portal hypertension, you're going to dilate that because your portal system is like, yo, systemic system, take some of my blood, please. Um, and so it's going to try and do that, but then they're going to dilate. And when they dilate, they become weaker and they can burst. And that's when you get hematemesis. Cool? That's frank blood. Um, this is not esophageal varices, but if you have coffee ground vomit, um, you do call this coffee ground vomit in practice. It's not just a monash thing. It means lower GI bleeding usually. Or stuff like, it's not really lower, but uh, peptic ulcer disease or gastritis. Okay? All right, good. You're going to do this a lot next year as well. But basically, it's in when your lower esophageal sphincter doesn't work properly. And it lets stomach juices go up and irritate the lining. And so you can get Barrett's esophagus. And this is when you have a metaplasia. This is one of the questions on our pathology test. What is the definition of metaplasia? It's great fun. Um, and so the metaplasia is basically stratified squamous, which is your normal esophagus, to simple columna with goblet cells. And so who can tell me where would you normally find simple columna in goblet cells? What? Ooh, not your stomach. 
your intestines. And so it's very common. Yes, your stomach does have mucus. It doesn't have goblet cells. It has mucus cells. And so we can talk a bit about that later. But um, yeah, simple columnar goblet cells is only in the intestine. So you have an intestinal metaplasia. Um, Gord can give you, so barrett esophagus can give you cancer. We actually had this patient, I saw a gastroscopy, their duodenum, like the hole to get into the duodenum was like one millimeter big. They were restricted so bad. And the guy went in, the gastroenterologist went in, he looked at it for 10 seconds. He's like, sorry, this guy's screwed. Off to the Alfred or wherever he went because we couldn't deal with him there. Um, so that's cool. There was another guy who had cancer of his esophagus and it was super restricted. And so he couldn't really talk. Um, that was sad. But it was cool because that's the first. <laughs> it was. It's still sad, but it's just because like you forget while you're in second year. It's actually all about patience, not trying to be cheesy or anything. But that was the first time that a patient has actually recognized me. I came in late, and the consultant and stuff, everyone was there, and he turned around and he raised his head and he waved at me. So that made me happy. This is good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> This is on recording, isn't it? <laughs> All right, stomach. So you've got hiatus hernias. Um, we'll talk about peptic ulcer disease later. And so you've got two types of hernias, um, sliding and parasophageal. Sliding is the more common one. And this is basically where your entire stomach just goes up. And so the gastroesophageal junction is displaced, but the fundus remains in place. OK? I don't have a picture. I don't know why I don't have a picture. But basically, just imagine your entire stomach squeezing through that hole and going up. You guys know what it looks like, yeah? Yeah, cool. And then you've got parasophageal. So this is where your junction doesn't go up. Your junction stays in place, but a little bit of the fundus is like whoop, and it goes through the hole, and it sticks out the top of the diaphragm. Um, and these can both cause reflux as well, reflux esophagitis, similar to gourd. OK, liver, Pringle maneuver. Um, no, this is not a way to eat Pringles, how Italians eat Pringles, I don't know, whatever that meme was. This is basically, when you want to do liver surgery, you don't want its artery and its vein and its bile to be flowing through while you're cutting that thing up. And so you want to clip them. And the easiest, best way to clip it is within the hepatoduodenal ligament, which is part of what? Yep, I had less momentum, good. And so basically, you're going to put one finger in your amental beta and the other one on top of the ligament. And whatever you're holding is basically the portal triad before it's the portal triad. And so you're going to just clip that. And then you're good. Cool? All right, gallbladder. So I remember when we first saw this, there was a bunch of words. It should be second nature to you now. Cholelithiasis can lead to cholecystitis. Cholidocolithiasis can lead to cholangitis, okay? This makes you very sick. Um, and the symptoms of ascending cholangitis is basically, it's ascending because there's a massive gallstone there and the bile can't go down, so it just ascends up. And this is called Charcot's triad. Um, it should be red probably. And that's when you have right upper quadrant pain, obviously, jaundice, obstructive jaundice, which we'll talk about later, and you get a fever. And it's usually a high fever. And it's not, Unfair to say you will probably have, you know, shakes and um, rigors as well with this because it's really bad. Okay, and the pancreas. So there's three different things with the pancreas. You've got pancreatitis, annular pancreas, and the head of uh, cancer of the head of the pancreas. So pancreatitis, what symptoms do you get? You get epigastric pain, which radiates to the back, and patients usually describe this as a boring pain. Um, boring, not as in this revision lecture, as in... I feel like something is burrowing through me. And it's relieved by sitting forward, um, same as gourd kind of thing. And you get steatorrhea, which is basically loose, foul-smelling, greasy stools. Um, and who can tell me why that is? I don't have supersonic hearing. I'm sorry, you're going to have to speak up. OK, I'm assuming you guys know. Even if you don't, it's all right. Um, that's because your pancreas isn't working, and so it can't secrete all of those enzymes. And so it can't break down the fat. Um, and that's why it's going to be really greasy. It's going to float. So if someone says, my stools are hard to flush, it means they might have pancreatitis. Um, 
and they're going to be foul smelling. And the fancy term we use for that is offensive. Okay, because you don't want to offend the patient. You don't want to say that poo stinks. That happens a lot in medicine, actually. It's pretty cool. If you think someone has psychological issues, I learned this the other day, you say they have super tentorial issues because oh, you haven't done brain. But like there's a tentorium cerebelli which separates your cerebellum, you know what that is, from your cerebrum. And so super tentorial, you're basically saying in nice that they have a problem with their brain, which is a psychological <laughs> issue. Um, you don't want to say cancer in front of a patient. Um, that's not nice. And so you call it a hypermitotic lesion. Hyper meaning lots. Mitosis, it's dividing lots. And uh, lesion is just, you call everything a lesion in medicine. All right, that stuff's not important. Okay, the causes, this is important. And so I get smashed. I think the first four are probably the more important ones. That's why I've written them. Um, idiopathic, your body is just like, you know what? I've been good to you for 20 years. Screw you, I'm going to give you pancreatitis. Gallstones, like we talked about, if they um, dislodge distally down the biliary trees. Ethanol, and so if someone comes in, you know, Manoj has had a, a good night out, you know, 20 standard drinks. And now he's got epigastric pain gone to his back. It might be pancreatitis. It's probably if if it's a Monash question, that's pancreatitis. Um, and then trauma as well. And you got another, lots of other things. Um, this E is ERCP, uh, endoscopic retrograde pancreo somethingography, and that's actually how you treat gallstones. So it's interesting because while you're trying to diagnose slash treat it, you can actually cause pancreatitis. Okay, annular pancreas. So this is a an embryological problem, and this is when you know the pancreas when it does this thing. Um, so the head of the pancreas actually sits inside the duodenum, not like in the wall. But if this is the duodenum, in this hole here is where you have the head of the pancreas. And so while it's doing its flippy thing, it can actually squash the duodenum, um, and that's not good. So that's called annular pancreas. And then you've got pancreas. Pancreatic cancer, the head of the pancreas, this can obstruct the bile duct because they're very close to each other and this can cause jaundice. And so you would have heard of Cavoisier's law, some French thing. This is when you have three things. If you have jaundice, you have a distended gallbladder, but it's non-tender, it's painless. Then it's probably, it, the cause is not gallstones. And if you translate that to Monash world, um, it means it's a cancer of the head of the pancreas. Cool. So it's a buzzwordy thing if you see 1 plus 2 plus 3, head of pancreas cancer. Um, any questions? Cool. It is 5.30. Finish at 6.15. That should be fine. Um, if we need, we can skip farm and microbiome because that's right memorization. And we hate it anyway, so it's fine. Sorry, Richard. Um, but we should be good. All right, mid-gut and hindgut conditions. And so you've got, well, first you've got a diverticulum in general. Who can tell me what a diverticulum is? Yeah, yeah, that look. It's like you're an airplane person and you're like, the exits are here. Um, yeah, that was pretty much right. It's basically when you have an outpouching in your colon and it makes like a little bloop. I guess the appendix is a diverticulum. Looks like one. Um, and you've got different types, but that doesn't really matter. And so there's a specific type, which is Meckel's diverticulum. And this has a rule of twos. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, so where is it most commonly found? Two feet, so it's obviously American, two feet proximal to the ileocecal valve. It is two inches in length. The people usually present at two years old, and men get it twice as much as females. A volvulus is Latin for twisting of the bowel, I think. And so you can get different types. You can get a volvulus pretty much anywhere. But the sigmoid, because it has a long free mesentery, so that means it's very prone to getting a volvulus because it just twists on itself. Um, if you have a sequel volvulus, in Monash world at least, it's almost always a congenital thing. If you do an abdominal x-ray, and you see a volvulus, it's going to be a coffee. You'll see the coffee bean sign. Have you guys seen that in radiology? You haven't? Oh, I should have got a picture. Bad luck. You can Google it. Um, it basically just looks like a huge coffee bean. Okay. And you've got appendicitis. 
you will see a lot of appendicitis. This was actually the first thing I diagnosed by myself. Like I just rocked up to ED because you can. Um, it's cool. You can just go anywhere, even if you're not on that rotation. Rocked up to ED. Person was like, go see this patient. I'm like, okay. And then he had pretty much everything in appendicitis, which is really cool. Um, so please do learn these things. Yes, it is a bit different in the real world and patients present differently, but most of the time they present with what the main things are, which is what we teach you guys. So appendicitis, you got initially in the first you know, day or two, you've got vague periumbilical pain, so just in the center here, and that transitions to right iliac fossa pain, and that's really sharp. Um, that pain is over McBurney's point, which is one thirds from the umbilicus, two thirds from the umbilicus, one third from the aces. Um, who can tell me why it goes from vague to sharp? You can come. Uh, you weren't looking at me, you were making eye contact. So. Yeah, basically. And so the visceral pain is dull pain. And so the patient, you'll be like, oh, where's the pain? They're like, oh, it was just like, you know, kind of in the middle here. Um, and as soon as it contacts the peritoneum, which is somatic pain, which is really sharp, um, they're like, yeah, you can point to where it is. Good job. So what signs you get, there's like six of them, there's psoas and obturator and whatever. The important ones you have to know is McBurney's. It's not really a sign, it just means you've got pain over Mc, McBurney's point. Um, you've got all the peritoneal signs, so you know, ten, tenderness, uh, guarding and rigidity. You've got rebound tenderness, which basically means if you press down on the stomach slowly, it's going to hurt, obviously. But if you release really quickly, it's going to hurt a lot, and they're going to scream in pain. And that's basically because imagine this is the imagine this is the peritoneum. You kind of push it down slowly, and then you let go, and it just goes bang, and it rebounds and it hits the wall again, and that hurts. And you've got Rob Singh sign, which is if you press on the right, no, the left iliac fossa. You're going to get pain in the right iliac fossa, and that's basically because you're stretching the peritoneum, and that's causing pain. So yeah, Monash will probably chuck all of these in a question, and it'll be appendicitis. Okay, now hernias, and so you've got two types of hernias, and you know how I said we were talking about the different folds of um, the abdominal wall, and so it's important the lateral embryonic fold contains the epigastric inferior epigastric arteries. These two here. So a, these are both inguinal hernias. A direct inguinal is going to be medial to the inferior epigastric, okay? And that's basically going to punch through the wall. Um, and this area is called Hesselbach's triangle. It, there's three borders, obviously, to the triangle. We didn't have to know. I don't know if you guys do. Um, and then you've got indirect, which is lateral to these vessels. And that basically means it goes through this canal here, and it can go as far as into your scrotum as well. Okay, now we've got hemorrhoids. Um, so we talked about the, well, firstly, what are hemorrhoids? Actually, no, we get to that in like one minute, in 10 seconds, actually. Um, so if you have hemorrhoids, if they're above the pectinate line, you're going to have dull pain. And if it's below the line, you're going to have sharp pain. And that's because above it was endoderm with the visceral nerves. Below it was ectoderm with the somatic nerves. Um, motility problem. I don't know how much you covered these. But you would have done, done them in clinical. So dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, adenophagia, whatever. Achalasia is failure, failure of the sphincter to relax. So it's basically just squashed like that. Um, and it's usually used in um, reference to the lower esophageal sphincter. You can have gastroparesis, which is in delayed, um, it causes delayed gastric emptying. And the most common person who have this is um, a diabetic. And so you know how you get peripheral neuropathy with a diabetic, you can also get autonomic neuropathy. And so that can cause this, that can cause postural hypotension, it can cause a lot of things. So don't become a diabetic, please. Um, you will see a lot of that. I think it was a crazy number, like one quarter of all people at the hospital I'm at had diabetes, like at only one point. So you will get to see it a lot. And the last one is again a congenital thing, um, Hirschsprung's disease. And this is, it basically causes a toxic megacolon. And this is when your parasympathetic stimulate, stimulation during development doesn't go all the way down um, to the distal colon and the rectum. And so that basically becomes huge. I don't know what the mechanism is. Um, you can Google it if you want. Any questions? Go. No?
everything I've said had made sense so far. That's good. You guys, you guys are nice. All right, vascular condition. And so we talked about this. Um, I mentioned it before. Perforations. Um, again, this is a very Monash thing. In real life, it's not 100% like this, but that's okay. Um, so if you have a gastric ulcer and erodes the back of the stomach, it's going to erode into the splenic artery. Um, and if you, the posterior duodenum, who can remember what, which part of the duodenum? First part, D1. Yep. And so if you have a peptic ulcer, peptic usually refers to a duodenal ulcer, um, that's going to erode into the gastroduodenal artery. And these are going to give you GI bleeding. Um, there was something, okay, so if you have, I think this is one of our exam questions. If you have the splenic artery eroding, what space will it fall into? So you guys know like Morrison's pouch, Douglas' pouch. Who? Nope. Maybe that wasn't GI. Maybe I covered it, but okay, we'll talk about that later. But basically this is, it's going to collect in the amental versa. Okay, you remember that Pringle maneuver where you put your finger through the hole? Where you put your finger through the foramen? Um, yeah, so that gives you access to the amental bursa, which is just behind the stomach and just in front of the pancreas. So this is the pancreas, this is the stomach, this is the amental bursa. So that's where it's going to collect. It came up for us, it might come up for you guys. Um, nutcracker syndrome, have you guys done this? Yeah, good. And so this is basically, you've got your aorta here, You've got your SMA here, and this is your left renal vein in the middle. Um, and basically, if you've got atherosclerosis most of the time, uh, these are going to compress the vein. And therefore, your left renal vein and along with um, your testicular vein, the left bone, these aren't going to drain as well. So you're going to get a varicose seal, which looks like this. And when you shine a torch onto the scrotum, you're going to see the bag of worms sign, which just looks like a bag of worms. Okay, and this is the portal hypertension thing. So there's three places in which the portal system is like, yo, I need help. Can I give you some of my blood? So lower esophagus, we already talked about. You get esophageal varices. Um, the umbilicus, this is where your portal umbilical veins and your systemic ones meet, and you'll get caput medusae. I asked one of my dudes, my consultants, sorry, um, have you actually, <laughs> my dudes, have you actually seen this? And he's like, no. So there's a lot, I mean, you know, infective endocarditis, you're not going to see splinter hemorrhages in like 70 years. Because in Australia, you just catch it before that. Um, so you don't see this middle one. You do see the top one. You do see the bottom one. And so in the anal canal at the pectinate line is also when the two systems meet. And so, yeah, the superior rectal and the middle slash inferior rectal veins. And these will give you hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoid is basically a vein bulging out. And when it bursts, that's when you get bleeding. More about GI bleeding, and so this is lower GI bleeding. So if you've got really low GI bleeding, you're going to get frank blood, which is hematochesia. And if you're going to get upper GI bleeding, eventually by the time it makes its way down, you know, all the red pigments have been digested, so it's going to look like melina, um, which is black and tarry and disgusting to smell. Um, and you've also got occult blood, which basically means you can't see it with your eyes. And this is what we screen for in a fecal occult blood test, which is used to detect what commonly? I think I had cancer. Yeah, bowel cancer. And so when you're 65, I think, everyone's going to get one. Maybe it's no, not 65, maybe it's 50. Um, everyone gets one, and you poo into a little thing, and then they test it for blood. OK, so this is the thing I was talking about. Maybe you do it later. Maybe you've already done it. Um, where does fluid accumulate inside your body? So what are the most dependent, which means what are the most lower areas of your abdominal cavity? When you're lying down, it's your hepatorenal recess here, which is known as Morrison's pouch. When you're standing up, uh, for a male, it's the recto-vesical pouch. So that's basically the area between your rectum and your vesicle, which is your bladder. Thanks for coming. See ya. Thank you. Recto-vesical pouch. And in a woman, you've got recto uterine because you've got a uterus. And that's called the pouch of Douglas. So you guys have done this or haven't? You have done this. Okay, good. 
I was asked this like by a consultant, so keep it in mind. Don't just forget everything when you walk out the door of the topic test. Not a, please don't forget everything as you walk out the door of today. Um, okay, referred pain. So this is related to the appendicitis thing we did. So basically the visceral pain is not, you know, you can't point to it. It's a vague area. And so the foregut structures are going to refer to epigastrium. Midgut is going to be periumbilical. And your hindgut is going to be suprapubic, which is why your appendix, which is a midgut structure, um, gives you periumbilical pain initially. Okie dokie. Questions? I heard A. Nice. Who's that? Oh, hello. I cannot stuff this up. Did I hear someone say, mm, thanks for the face, man? <laughs> All right, makes sense. Yeah, it's lateral, therefore it's indirect. And as we said before, it's meant to be tunica vaginalis, but if it's still open, it's a processus vaginalis. And direct hernia would be C. Um, it's, uh, it's medial to the inferior epigastrics, and it's, it just punches through the abdomen. And so this is usually after, you know, when you're old and your muscles don't work as well. If it's a hernia which happens after a surgery, after a surgical incision, does anyone know what that's called? I said it, I said it in the word. Not a surgical hernia, 50-50 chair, it's an incisional hernia. Um, cool. I'm, he I'm hearing S's, which I'm assuming is a C. Yeah, cool. And so in men, it's the recto visceral pouch. In women, what is it? D, yeah, D or B is the same thing. If you're lying down, it's Morrison's pouch. No, not less. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait, sorry. Who answered that? You put your hand up first. Oh, mate. Oh, mate. Oh, you blew it. Cool. D. Is it D? It's D. Who said that? You? Uh, yeah, that's simple enough. Get it? Simple enough. <laughs> we'll let everyone think about it, but I'm going to put like a 10 second timer. Because not everyone reads fast like you. Yeah, cool, D. Um, and so this is Vesky Charcot's triad. Jaundice, pain, high fever. And so 38.3 is decently high. What's normal temperature? 36.5 to 37.5. Um, yeah, and so a good way of looking at things, if I mean, this is a spot diagnosis, at least for Monash, but a good way is to exclude things. And so it's right upper quadrant, so it can't be appendicitis. Um, it can be cholecystitis. It can be this. It can be this. It can be this. No. Um, you've got jaundice. So it can be this. Maybe. No, it can't be this. So it's either going to be cholecystitis or ascending cholangitis or hepatitis. Um, and they've got a temperature, which means there has to be some kind of inflammatory process. Um, so it can be all three of those things again, but because it's a high fever, it's more likely going to push you towards ascending cholangitis. And you would do a liver function test to confirm what it is, which we will talk about in this. What? C, nice. So yeah, um, A, B, and D were those connection points. Splenomegaly is basically due to, because your splenic vein drains into your portal system. And so if there's backflow, it's going to get big. And ascites is also same thing, um, just backflow. 
the first sign I ever felt in hospital was um, hepatosplenomegaly, which is pretty cool because it's not a very common thing. Um, well, I didn't feel the splenomegaly. The doctor was like, did you feel it? I said, yes, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you will do that a lot. Oh, the best thing was it was a bedside shoot. And he was like, do a cardiovascular exam on it, on it, on the person. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay. And so you start off with the pulse. And for the life of me, I couldn't feel his pulse. Um, I took, made him take his watch off. I arranged it like, I don't know, 30 seconds. And I'm meant to be done by then. And I'm like, you know what? I'm sorry, I can't do this. I didn't say that because it was the first bedside shoot. And so the guy was on dialysis. And if you're on dialysis, you have a fistula. And so that huge thing was just pulsing over on the other arm. So I looked over there and then I looked at my watch and then I realized I wore the watch which doesn't work that day. Like I, this watch works, I have another one which doesn't work. And so I literally just looked at his fistula for about five seconds, cause I'd been gone for a minute now, for five seconds and I'm like, yep, 75 beats per minute, cool, moving on. That, that patient also had aortic stenosis. Have you guys done murmurs? Murmurs are really cool. Um, that was cool. All right, anyway, sorry. Um, what condition would give you abdominal striae apart from unknown pregnancy? Oh, you haven't done this. Sorry. Um, Cushing syndrome. That's. Have you done that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. Someone said chocolate. Yeah, who? <laughs> Let's go. Uh, uh. C. C or D? Fight it out. C or D? C? Some people said D. Hands up for C? Hands up for D? Nah, we'll go C. Um, good thought though. So yeah, this was the cross tenderness, rebound tenderness. Um, since the pain's in the right iliac fossa, it means it's moved to being peritin, like peritoneal pain. And so you're going to get tenderness when you press at McBurney's point. And rigidity and guarding is also because they're in pain. And yeah, not positive Murphy sign. What is Murphy sign associated with? Cholecystitis. Good. All right. Physiology. So with phys. Did you guys have these six same lectures? We had six lectures. Pardon? Oh, was it? Okay, cool. Well, I'm covering these six things. So appetite, you've got different hormones which make you do different things. Um, ghrelin, so ghrelin makes your stomach go grr. It promotes hunger. This only acts on the NPY pathway. I'll talk about the pathways later. Um, thanks for coming, man. It's produced by the grenal ghrelinergic GIT cells, which is nicely named. Then you got the opposite. Thanks for coming. <laughs> then you've got leptin, which inhibits hunger, it's the opposite, and it's produced by adipose cells. Um, and then you've got insulin, which also inhibits hunger, and it's produced by your pancreatic beta cells. The last one is orexin. Did you guys watch that video about that dog? No? It's just like a dog, and every time you show it food, it falls asleep, like instantly. Oh. It was so cute. I can't believe they took that out. But basically, orexin increases food craving. And if you have a lack of it, you get narcolepsy, which is falling asleep. So every time you see food, well, every time the dog saw food and it had an increase in food craving, it fell asleep, which is really cute. Um, do you guys still have Parkinson? Parkinson. Oh, my God. That was so, I'm so sorry. That was not on purpose. Do you still have her? Oh, she's a gem. She's great. Okay. Appetite, different pathways. So where is your appetite control center? It's in the arcuate nucleus in your hypothalamus. You'll do that more in brain, which is probably the best anatomy ever. Um, you guys have so much fun stuff to look forward to. I'm jealous. Then you've got your two pathways. So you've got neuropeptide Y, agouti related peptide neuron, this thing. And this pathway basically promotes the food intake. So it increases your appetite. It reduces your energy expenditure. And what regulates it? So ghrelin activates it, leptin and insulin, insulin block it. Pretty easy. Then you've got POMC, um, which inhibits food intake, and it's regulated only by leptin and insulin. Ghrelin does nothing on POMC. And so this is, it's useful to know, POMC doesn't actually directly act on its target thing. 
it's cleaved into a number of things, including alpha MSH, which then acts on a second order neuron, and then it has its action. So this was an important thing for us. I don't know how important it is for you. Um, you get this in another condition, but that's not GI related. Okay, vomiting. So there's different zones which control it. You've got your main one, which is your chemoreceptor trigger zone. Have you guys covered this? A little bit. So is it a lot of important or not a lot of important? Okay. I'll do it anyway because we got time and you guys don't have a life, so you have nothing to do on a Friday night. Um, so where is the CTZ related? It's in the area postrema, which is obviously in your brain. Um, this is basically the main area which controls vomiting. And how does it do this? It's pretty cool because you've got the blood-brain barrier, which means anything in your blood can't really get into your brain unless it's super specific. But this place doesn't have a blood-brain barrier. So that's, you know, if you ingest something gross, this can actually go to your brain and that area can detect it and it's like, yo, vomit. This is when medicine is nice. The second main area is called the vomiting center. Um, labyrinth, so this is motion sickness. If you go around a, what's a spinny thing, a Ferris wheel? No, a Ferris wheel is not fast, a roller coaster. If you go around a roller coaster really fast, your labyrinths in your ear, which will, you will do with head and neck, um, they basically make you sick and you can throw up. And so that's the mechanism. And the third one is your mechano and chemo receptors in your GIT. So I guess this is basically when you eat something which makes you sick, these uh, receptors are responsible. So this is the main one. This is the second one. This is only for motion sickness, and this is pretty much only for like food sickness. Okay. Did that all make sense? Hmm. Someone didn't look, didn't, no, yeah. Do you want me to go over it again, or do you want to just skip ahead and you guys can look over it in your own time? Okay, so does that mean it's not important? Okay, cool. Did you do saliva? Did you guys do fizz, man? Come on. Okay, GI fizz was actually really fun, but we'll get to the good bits later. Okay, saliva is secreted from intrinsic glands, which is your tongue and your pharynx, and this is all the time. Um, and extrinsic glands, glands, so you've got your parotid, your sublingual, and your submandibular. What is it made of? It's uh, pH is 7.4, which means it's kind of basic. Um, and it's composed with isane here. No, I'm sorry. Um, and so it's mostly made of water and ions and enzymes. So it's basic, that's important. We'll come to that later. What's it regulated by the parasympathetic nervous system? This was important for us. Um, most potent stimulator is nausea. Most potent inhibitor is sleep. Why would nausea stimulate it? Yeah. So your brain is like, oh, I'm feeling nauseous. I might vomit. Vomit brings up a lot of acid with it. And so you, your body's preparing to counteract that. Cool. All right. The different cells. Did you do this? Cool. This is important. And so like we said before, someone said you don't actually have goblet cells in your stomach. They're only in the intestine. The thing which makes mucus is the kindly named mucus cells, which is, excuse me, which is all over the, uh, the surface of the stomach. That's easy. Sheep cells, this is inside your gastric glands, and these secrete pepsinogen and lipase. Okay? Breaks down protein, breaks down fat. Then you've got your G cells, and these are enteroendocrine, which means they're secreted into your blood. Um, these are also in your gastric glands, and these secrete gastric. We'll get to what it does. Um, then you've got your ECL cells, enterochromaffin-like cells. These are also enteroendocrine, um, and they secrete histamine. And then you've got D cells, which is also enteroendocrine, and this is in multiple places, but this secretes somatostatin. And we'll get to what these three things do. But mucus makes sense. Hepcinogen and lipase makes sense, yes? Cool. Ah, uh, this is actually really cool. You guys have done this? Yep, cool. So parietal cells are probably the most important one, and they're in the gastric glands as well. What do they do? They secrete uh, HCL and intrinsic factor. What part of the small intestine was responsible for absorbing intrinsic factor? I mean, B12. Yeah, nice. <laughs> okay. So how is, uh, how is HCL secretion regulated? 
it's activated by those things we said before, histamine and gastrin and acetylcholine, which is your parasympathetic neurotransmitter, basically, yep, and your gut is parasympathetic. And what inhibits it? Somatostatin. Um, that's going to be important. And so what is the actual process, itse process itself? So you've got water. It splits into hydrogen and hydroxide. You've got uh, carbon dioxide, which enters in. These two combine via carbonic and hydros, and they make bicarb. Bicarb is excreted into your bloodstream for chloride, um, which then is pumped all the way through to the lumen. Um, so you've got the Cl part of it. You still need the H part of it. And the H is pretty much swapped by a HK ATPase, um, which means it's active transport. It's swapped um, into the lumen. And then these two combine, and you get HCl. Cool? Makes sense? Any questions? <laughs> nice. OK, gallbladder. Did you guys do bile much? Yes? Good. So it's secreted by the liver. I actually thought it was made by the gallbladder, like before I started med. Um, so it's secreted by the liver, and it's stored in super concentrated um, amounts in the gallbladder. What does it do? It emulsifies lipid. It breaks them up. Um, it neutralizes pH, because it's basic. Um, and you can use it to excrete pigment. How is it excreted? Well, it's not really excreted. Your body doesn't want to keep making it again and again. So 95% of it is absorbed, um, reabsorbed in the distal ileum, and it goes back to the liver to be used. Was bile salts important? A little bit. Um, so how are they made? It's made from cholesterol. What is the rate limiting step of cholesterol synthesis? HMG CoA reductase. Like, that's the main thing which is responsible. I don't know if you guys did this in biochem. Um, the rate limiting step for cholesterol is 7 alpha hydroxylase. And secondary is when that bile salt is acted on by the intestinal bacteria. Cool. How does emulsification happen? You've got a big lipid droplet, you shake it up like inside your stomach or inside your duodenum, whatever. So you get a little emulsion droplet. That is when the bile salt comes along and attacks it. And it basically holds it apart. Because you know when you shake fat, like you have fat in water and you shake it up, it's going to be separated, but then it's going to clump together again. So it holds it apart. And that's um, when lipase can come along. Lipase was secreted by what cell? Which stomach cell secreted lipase? Chief cells. Good. And so then it's um, monoglycerides and fatty acids, and those can finally be absorbed. OK, bilirubin. You guys done this? Cool. So this is a red blood cell up here, and it's broken down. And you get hemoglobin from it. Hemoglobin is separated into heme and globin. We don't care about globin. We're going to follow heme. So heme is then split into iron and biliverdin. We don't care about iron, so we'll follow biliverdin. Biliverdin is green. So biliverdin is then uh, turned into unconjugated bilirubin. This happens pretty much immediately. All right, And unconjugated bilirubin is orange. So then this um, travels to the liver via albumin, which is basically the school bus of your body. It carries everything around. And that's because it's not water soluble. So it needs to attach to a protein to travel around. Cool. When it gets to the liver, it's converted via this thing into conjugated bilirubin, uh, which is still orange. And then this is secreted into your duodenum. So you know it goes down the biliary tree and into the duodenum as bile. And this can be, well, this is converted then into urobilinogen by the intestinal bacteria. OK? So it has to get into your intestines first, and then it's converted. And then it can do two things. Most of it, I think it's like 90% of it, uh, becomes stercobilin, which is brown, and it's responsible for the color of your poo. And some of it um, is turned into urobilin. Okay? And that's what makes your urine yellow. So this will be important in like one second. Okay, so jaundice. Jaundice is fun. You guys have done jaundice properly. Yeah. Your lecture didn't show up. Oh, okay. All right, let's learn about jaundice. And so what is jaundice? So basically, this is bilirubin here, all of this stuff. When it builds up too much, you get jaundice. And so the normal amount is like 17-ish. So it needs to be twice the normal amount uh, to be clinically evident. How is it clinically evident? You get your classic yellow skin, 
and you can get scleroicterus, so the whites of your eyes become yellow. So there's three different mechanisms for doing this, prehepatic, hepatic, and post-hepatic. Uh, this is important to know, so should I slow down because you guys haven't done it? I'll slow down a little bit because we've got 15 minutes left, which is enough time. So, okay, so basically with anything you can think about is a problem before, at, or after the organ. With the kidneys, um, with renal failure, is a problem before it, at the kidneys, or after the kidneys. So same concept. So you've got why do you get prehepatic jaundice? It's usually, in Monash world anyway, it's because of increased hemolysis. So you remember, this is blood cells being broken down. So if too many blood cells are being broken down, what's going to happen? You get increased hemolysis, therefore you get increased heme, therefore you get increased unconjugated bilirubin in the blood. So you've got you know twice as much of this stuff floating around, and your poor liver can't keep up. And therefore, this bilirubin is going to build up. Okay? And so what are you going to get? You're going to get increased unconjugated bilirubin in the blood because it's unconjugated because it never made it to the liver in the first place. Your liver was like, sorry, I can only take half of you guys. The other half keep floating around. So you get that on a blood test. Um, normal urine and normal stools because the liver is still doing its job. It's conjugating, you know, let's say, 100 of them, and those are still contributing to your urine color, your stool color. It's not the liver's fault that instead of 100, there's 200 now, okay? And so they love jaundice kind of questions. And so know this, normal urine, normal stool, and jaundice means it's prehepatic. Cool, any questions? Then you've got hepatic. And so this is obviously a problem with your hepatocytes. And what happens, your hepatic cells are damaged, you know, hepatitis or whatever it is. And this is after they've done the conjugation. And instead of going down as bile, they actually leak out into the blood as conjugated bilirubin. And so what are you going to get? You're going to get increased conjugated bilirubin in the blood. We'll talk about the liver things. Um, and you're going to get dark urine and normal stools. So remember, unconjugated was not water soluble. Conjugated is water soluble. So if it's water soluble, your kidneys can take it up and they can put it in the urine and it's going to be really dark. Okay. So if someone comes in, dark urine and normal stools because you still have, just because it's leaking some of it out, it's still passing a lot of it down as bile and it's still going through the intestine, it's still being converted to stercobilin and still brown, okay? So dark urine, normal stools and jaundice means it's a hepatic cause. Cool? That wasn't too fast? No? You have the sides anyway so you can look at them. And the last one is post-hepatic, so this is an obstruction. Usually it's a gallstone. So basically you're blocking the bile duct and all of that lovely conjugated stuff which was trying to make its way down is now going to be backlogging up. And so this is conjugated and it's going back into the blood. So in this one you're going to get increased conjugated bilirubin. You're going to get these things released which we'll talk about. You're going to get dark urine because remember conjugated can be taken up in your kidneys and then it can be excreted in the urine. And super important Biggest thing, you're going to get pale stools. What was responsible for the brownness of the stools? Stercobilin. Yeah, and stercobilin was made from conjugated bilirubin. How did conjugated bilirubin get into your intestines? Through the biliary tree. So if you're blocking off the biliary tree, it's just going to hit it and go back. None of it's going to get through, which means you're going to get none of the brown stuff, which means you're going to get pale stools. So this is probably the most buzzwordy thing out of all of jaundice. Dark urine, pale stools, and jaundice means it's a gallstone, pretty much. Happy? Okay, the last one is Gilbert syndrome. Um, it's really cool because I went like 18 years before realizing one of my family members actually had Gilbert syndrome. So it doesn't actually turn you jaundice. Um, they're just a little bit darker. Um, this is basically a deficiency in an enzyme, UGT. Who cares what UGT is? Um, well, we care because it conjugates bilirubin, and so you can't conjugate it as well, which means you have a tiny amount of extra bilirubin <coughs> floating around. Um, <coughs> so they're always a little bit jaundiced or a little bit darker. And this is benign, nothing to worry about. <coughs> uh, I think like 10% of the population has it. So Manoj probably has it, you're a bit dark. I probably have it. <laughs> but yeah. <coughs> 10 minutes, let's go. Liver function test, have you guys done this? 
at all was it meant to be today okay <clears throat> this is just mem memorization the liver does a lot of things it makes albumin which was the school bus which transports everything around if you have low albumin it means your liver's not working okay but it doesn't happen in one day this is very long term you know an al alcoholic who has liver cirrhosis we will go to okay we'll go to these two first so ggt and alp these are basically your gallstone markers and ast and alt are your liver markers and so when you have liver damage you're going to get release of these things into the blood when you have a gallstone problem you're going to have ggt and alp being released okay and so yeah if you have your liver function test which comes out and you've got huge amounts of GGT and ALP, there's an obstructive problem, okay? So there's a gallstone in your bi common bile duct maybe. If you have AST and ALT being the ones that are primarily elevated, it means there's something wrong with the liver. And depending on the ratios, it means different amounts of whatever's wrong. Um, so if they're equal but elevated, so if they're like this, it's ischemia. If AST is higher than ALT, it means alcohol hepatitis. Um, and so S is for stubbies. So too many stubbies, if the AST is higher, it means alcohol hepatitis. And if it's the other way around, if the L, um, that means it's hepatocellular. I don't know, L stands for liver, everything stands for whatever, everything's liver. But if ALT is higher, that means it's actual hepatocellular damage from viral hepatitis or whatever it is. If you have just GGT, but not ALP, that means someone has been having too much fun. Cool? Um, if you haven't learned it, it's like, it might seem like a lot now, but you'll read over it a few times, it'll be second nature. Okie dokie. Pancreas. It's got two types of secretions, endocrine and exocrine. Endocrine is into the blood. And it's, have you done this? Cool. It secretes two things, cholecystokinin, which is regulate it's activated by fatty or protein rich food coming into the duodenum and then what does it do it triggers triggers bile release all right and so basically your body's like oh we have all this fat and protein coming along we need to break it down and so it's going to trigger bile because bile um breaks down fat and it's going to trigger asana secretions from the pancreas which we will talk about very soon and that is to break down the protein okay and this is in the duodenum, whatever. This is cholecystokinin. And if you actually look at the word, cholecyst is gallbladder, kinin is move. So it makes the gallbladder move, which means it makes bile come out. It says from the liver, but it's both liver and gallbladder. Um, secretin is the other one. And this is when acidic food comes in. And this is like, yo, we have acid, we need to counteract it. Bicarb comes out, all right? And also bile. And this is also in the duodenum. So basically, your body senses fatty and protein-rich stuff, cholecystokinin comes out to counteract it. If it senses acidic stuff, secretin comes out to counteract it. Happy? All right, and then you've got exocrine secretions, which means it's into the ducts. And so you've got two types of cells. Uh, you have your ductal cells here, which were the bicarb ones. That's easy. And then you've got your asana cells. Um, and these secrete zymogens. Zymogen is basically an unactivated enzyme, and it secretes enzymes too. Um, for example, pancreatic lipase. Um, and this is basically to break down all of the stuff which you've just eaten. So how does it actually work? The first thing you get is trypsinogen. Yeah? Can you guys do that? Yeah. You've got trypsinogen, which is converted to trypsin by these membrane-bound enterokinases. So this is the first thing that happens. It comes out, bang, it hits these enzymes, and it's converted. And then these things, go on to activate all the other enzymes. All right? Cool. This is the last GI lecture, I mean the PIS lecture. Have you guys done this? Okay. And so you've got smooth muscle in your gastrointestinal system. You've got two layers, the outer one and the inner one. The outer one is longitudinal. The inner one is circular. And these are connected to form a syncytium, which basically means they work um, together. How is it controlled? Sensory, obviously, somatic obviously autonomic which we'll talk about and the most imp important thing is the enteric nervous system which is so cool like your stomach basically has its own nervous system um so what does it actually mean you've got two plexuses in your enteric nervous system 
you've got the outer one, which is your myenteric plexus, which means muscle plexus. And so it's also called the plexus of our back. And it's between the two muscle layers, which makes sense. You want to be able to control both of the muscle legs, so you're going to be in between them. And so you see orange thing, and you go see this bile-colored thing, and in the middle of it, you've got this white stuff, which is um, the myenteric plexus. All right, and like we said, it controls the muscle, so it controls how much you contract. Secondly, you've got the inner one, which is your submucosal plexus, and this is mycinus plexus. And this is obvious. This is within the submucosa, nice and easy. Um, and it controls your secretions. So it has to be closer inside to be able to control those secretions. All right? You've got muscles along your entire length of your GIT system, but you don't have secretions along the entire length. Okay? So my enteric muscle, submucosal is secretions. M is for muscles, S is for secretions. Okay, so that was the enteric nervous system. What does the autonomic nervous system do? And it basically amplifies the enteric. So the enteric can function, if you cut off all of your sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves, your gut system will still, or your enteric system will still work. But this greatly amplifies it. Parasympathetic, rest and digest, obviously it's gonna increase it. And if you're running away from a tiger, sympathetic, you don't wanna be digesting your hamburger or whatever it was. And lastly, we have sphincters, which we talked about briefly at the start. And these are rings of smooth muscle, and they're usually constricted at rest, okay? Usually you would think if they're chilling, they're gonna be open, but they're actually closed. Um, and there's seven of them. The first one, which is up here, and the last one, which is down there, um, are somatic nervous system. And these are your two S's, swallowing and pooing, okay? So these are the ones you can control. Then you've got the middle five of them. And these are controlled, you don't control them. Lower esophageal sphincter, pyloric sphincter, sphincter of body, ileocecal, and the internal anal sphincter. All right, are you guys familiar with that? Yeah, cool. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about how stuff goes down your, does anyone have any questions? No, nope. is this going straight over your heads or do you understand it? Good, good, nice. Okay, how does stuff get through the gastrointestinal system? So let's talk about small intestine first. You've got two types of contractions. Segmenting contractions is basically does this. It pushes it this way, and then this way, and then this way, and then this way. So it just moves it around in the same place, it mushes it up, and the purpose is to let you absorb all of those nutrients, okay? When it's done absorbing those nutrients, it's like we don't need this anymore, and you get the migrating myoelectric complex, which is basically peristaltic waves, which just, like, it's synchronous, so you go, like compresses, 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 and it basically pushes it along. And this moves the food to the large intestine. What is this activated by? It's activated by increased chyme pH and increased motilin. So motilin is just an enzyme, chyme pH. So this is basically when more food is coming along, and it's like, yo, we've got more food coming along, we need to go digest that one, so we need to get rid of this stuff first. Cool? And then you've got the large intestine. <clears throat> so this is basically analogous. You've got the slow ones, which are the haustral con contractions. And this is, yep, slow, uncoordinated things. It just moves. It takes about half an hour to move from one haustra to the other. And this is to absorb water and electrolytes. Because, you know, small intestine does the nutrients. Large intestine does the water and electrolytes. And then you've got mass movements, which is basically the pushing thing again. So you have a power propulsion, which sounds really cool. Um, and that is basically to excrete waste. When your body's done with it, it's like, go sit in the rectum until we're ready to deal with you. And it's activated by the gastrocolic and duodenocolic reflexes. So same thing. If you have, if you feel food in your duodenum, you're like, oh, we're going to have to make room for that. And so you push all of this out. And the last one is defecation. So parasympathetic nervous system contracts the rectum. So the rectum is basically where it stores the poo until it's ready to pull it out and it contracts it. Um, you'll relax your internal anal sphincter. So now it's in the anus. Um, if you relax it, so remember the first sphincter and the last one is voluntary. If you relax it, you're gonna poo. Um, if you don't relax it, you're gonna do some reverse peristalsis um, until the next time uh, you have these, the defecation reflex. Right. 6.15. Do we want to do questions? You know what? Why not? You have three seconds to answer each question. Come on.
I'm thinking we won't go through microbio and farm. Someone said B. Nice. <clears throat> hepatic cause, post-hepatic cause, pre-hepatic cause, hepatic cause. The cholecystitis doesn't actually block off the duct. Oh man, I'm sorry, we're leaving. Um, who was that? Quick. <clears throat> Yep, cool. <clears throat> right. What? Shout it loud on. D? Cool. And so salivation increases prior to vomiting. You do produce some saliva because remember you have the continuous ones. Um, no. And so, wait, yeah, no. Nah. And so there's three phases of your gap, like the response. You've got the top one and the middle one, and then there's like an intestinal one. I don't think it's too important, but that's true. And you guys would have experienced it yourself. Cool. Which of the following is false? Do I need to finish? A couple of minutes, cool. What? D. Do we agree? <coughs> Which of the following is false? A. Okay, so I don't have the diagram with me, but you remember how you have bicarb and you secrete bicarb out of the stomach into the veins so you can get that chloride in. And bicarb is a base. And so, yeah, you'll have higher pH. And this is called the alkaline tide. So after food, your stomach veins, or just in general, really, they have a higher pH. Um, yeah, this is true. This is true because Vegas is parasympathetic. If you stop parasympathetic, you're going to reduce your acid being secreted. And it's not going to result in a lower pH because lower pH means you have more acid. But G cells produce gastrin, which makes acid. And so if you don't have G cells, you don't have the acid, which means you don't have a lower pH, you have a higher pH. Cool? Yeah. Man, you're killing me here. Who's that? Which one? Oh, the back one. Someone will catch it. Oh, sorry. I think that there's not many questions left, so. What? B or D? D. Nice. Secretin does not do that. Okay. We'll just keep going. <clears throat> yep. Well done. So the initial thing which activates them is this, and then they can go and act activate the other stuff. Yeah, so someone said, yeah, question? It very well could, and this is when one asks screws you over, because most likely, are you more likely to have a pancreatic cancer? I guess if they said a seven-year-old man, it would be C. Um, but in general, they probably have some sort of hemolysis, I don't know, thalassemia or something. And so, yeah, someone said it's either A or C. Um, because there's no pain, it's probably not, you know, ascending cholangitis, so it's A. 
All right, and we are done. This is the big table I made. Wait, not, not yet. This is the big table. You can go over it. Microbio, these are buzzwords, which you should probably know. Um, that's it. Do we have any questions? No, nope. if you have any. Uh, guys, I don't think anyone uses email still, but just Facebook or email, whatever, if you have any questions. Thanks for coming. One last thing. Um, last year, I made a via PowerPoint. I don't know if some of you know about it, but some of you don't. Like covering everything from Med 1011, 1022, 2031 for the via. And so I don't know if you have access to that, but like this GI lecture was based a lot on that. So it's pretty much the same thing for every other system. Okay? So uh, Manoj can probably post it on the link or whatever. I'm happy for you guys to share it around. Um, all the best for this year, and we will see you in hospitals next year. Thank you. <laughs> Thank that was you. So good. Uh, Tess just came to say hi. Mate, yeah, you drove down from Trazen just to say hi. No, no, no. You twos. Guys, wait. <laughs>